For those of you who do not know about STEM Corps, uh, we are a department here on Texas Tech campus, uh, primarily focused on engaging STEM faculty. Um, we do lots of help uh, with faculty um, in helping them prepare research proposals, um, coordinate and run outreach programs, um, and really help uh, facilitate and build connections um, with STEM faculty across campus. Uh, with such a large campus, we often um, struggle making those connections across campus and so we're happy to help um, build the network um, and, and help facilitate in any way that we can. So um, today we are uh, joined um, by Dr. Uh, Joby Martinez. Um, she is the um, Executive Director of the Racial Justice Institute and Center for Anti-Racism. Um, and uh, she, um, both of those are affiliated with the National Diversity Council. Um, so she is um, going to be talking to us today. Um, she is also a part-time uh, consultant with um, Epic Collaborative Advisors and the, um, in, uh, hold on, sorry, uh, National Diversity Council. Um, so prior to her current um, position. Um, she served as a special assistant to the president for diversity and inclusion at the University of Houston downtown. Um, and uh, before becoming a full-time student, um, she was the managing director at the Division of Institutional Diversity and senior director of Cross-Cultural Academic Advancement Center here at Tech. And so um, she has the opportunity to uh, come home and speak with us today. And so we're really excited about that. Um, Dr. Martinez uh, completed her doctorate degree in 2018 um, here at Texas Tech um, in Media and Communications. Her area of research primarily focuses on diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic communication. Um, and so um, that is why we've asked her to come today. She's um, going to hopefully uh, give us some really great information. Um, and for those of you who follow her on Facebook, uh, you'll know that she's also a cat mom uh, to Tiger and Harvey. So uh, you might get a glimpse of them uh, in the background at some point. So um, we'll see how that goes, but uh, it'll be great. So um, without further ado, um, I would love to uh, welcome Dr. Martinez. Well, thank you. Um, I'm excited and honored to be back with Texas Tech, even if it is in a virtual space. Um, and I did that, that to my bio since I know some of you um, and we have a Facebook friendship. I thought I'd add that important piece of my bio that I'm cat mom because I think you all see that more than you see anything else um, on Facebook. So again, I'm really excited uh, to be here this afternoon. As Jessica said, hopefully I will deliver um, some information that's useful for you in your pursuit uh, for diversity, equity and inclusion whether through STEM core or other areas that you are working in. Um, this is a 50 minute presentation. I was told to um, organize something for about 50 minutes and then allow for Q and A afterwards. However, I've, I've built in some Q and A spaces throughout the presentation just so that we can, if need to be a pause, if there are questions or if there's an opportunity for dialogue that will do that. I know the title on your, um, on the invitation for today's seminar is different than the one I put up. Um, the discussion today will be a reflection of my work in anti-racism, but I thought this was a fitting title, uh, particularly right now. So if you don't recognize this, this is critical race theory. Um, and the original title to that study in that article was what is critical race theory doing in a nice field like education. But since it dealt with education, um, because critical race theory has kind of come under attack a, a little bit lately, um, I thought it would be a nice sort of transition to, to include that in my presentation today. So a little bit of, of recognition for critical race theory. And again, we do sort of position ourselves. And if you read the seminar invitation, you're probably wondering like, well, what is anti-racism doing or STEM or what can anti-racism do for STEM? And I hope to sort of be able to share that with you today. So I'll go over the agenda and then we'll get started with our discussion. So I always like to start my uh, presentations, especially around anti-racism with sort of an overview of terms because a lot of terms right now are being used interchangeably um, and they don't exactly mean the same thing. So we'll be doing that. Um, I'll give you a brief anti-racism to anti, anti introduction to anti-racism. When I say brief, it may actually come off quite long uh, because I'm going to talk about, it's almost in a retrospective of how I got involved with anti-racism. And it's important to note 
well, I'm, I'll, I'll let you know that I, I did that on purpose because I've been doing this for several years now and it actually started during my dissertation years, uh, but it's important to sort of highlight and discuss the opportunities and the challenges along the way, sort of pre the summer of racial reckoning as it's been called, and then post. So we have an opportunity to sort of dissect both of those um, anti-racism fields and, and times um, when, we were, when we've been doing this. And they all relate to higher education, except towards the end, I will get into a little bit of my consulting work. Um, I will, as I mentioned, a little bit of overview. My um, attention really was focused on STEM during my time at UHD. They had the University of Houston downtown secured an HHMI um, grant, Inclusive Excellence Grant, so Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And President Munoz asked me to help out with that. And so that became almost a year long or a year plus initiative um, on working with the HHMI grant and the STEM faculty, College of Science and Technology faculty, staff and deans. And so towards the end, that's where I'll get a little bit more into criticizing anti-racism work, um, criticizing diversity, equity and inclusion work. And, and know that in that criticism, I'm also criticizing myself and my previous work and my current work. Um, so when I say criticizing, I'm not criticizing outwardly. I'm also criticizing some of the things that I've been engaged in because that is what anti-racism is supposed to do. It's supposed to ask us to identify and question um, and reflect. And so then we'll sort of conclude with the challenges ahead. So I'll go ahead and get started with the terms. Oh, I wanted to note that this is sort of my screen when and it'll, this is my prompt for you. If you have questions, comments, these are kind of scattered throughout the presentation, but this also reminds me to pause um, maybe after a particular subject or a really, you know, interesting point where we can sort of stop and discuss. And so if you see this slide, this is the slide where I'll be pausing for questions, comments. I do understand that there are several individuals in charge of the chat room. Um, so if they'll help me moderate that and we can bring forward any questions, comments, or discussions when we pause for, um, when we pause at the, when we have these strategic pauses. Uh, but if anything does come up before that, please feel free to interrupt me or interject. Again, I do want to make this a, a sort of dialogue based. Um, I don't want to speak the whole 50 minutes. I can, and I'd love to, uh, but this is more for your benefit uh, than it is mine. I, well, it benefits all, uh, but again, I do want you to have the opportunity to participate. So why it's important for terms, um, why I think it's important for us to distinguish these terms is because if you've been paying attention to the media, which at this point, I'm not sure how you can't, um, social media, media, you're going to see the terms. We've been seeing the terms for several months now, anti-racism, racial equity, and racial justice. I think it's important, though, that we really distinguish the three because the three signify three different things. Anti-racism is a process. And I'll, I'll let you read the, um, the, the PowerPoints on your own as I continue to speak. But anti-racism is a process. And the process of identifying, eliminating, sometimes anti-racism and racial justice are used interchangeably when they are two very different things. Racial equity is kind of in the middle. And I do have a slide to explain this a little bit better, but I wanted to go over the terms now. Racial equity is the distribution, the equitable distribution of resources and opportunities. And again, these three terms are used interchangeably, um, but racial equity is not the same as anti-racism. Racial equity is an output of racial equity and racial justice is the outcome of anti-racism and racial equity work. And so it is a process while they are related, they mean totally different things. Um, and again, I always like to clarify this because in media and even in dialogue or even in some of the research or scholarship lately, you're starting to see these words used interchangeably, but they are, do not necessarily describe the same thing. We also see the two terms systemic racism and institutional racism used interchangeably. And in fact, I've read several articles where they said it's the same thing. Uh, but really, when we're dissecting this, we're looking at two different things. Uh, so systemic racism looks at the systems, right? The policies, practices, procedures, the things we talk about in anti-racism. But institutional racism is really looking at the institution. And the only way to, and, and I know sometimes people have a hard time distinguishing the two, but the way to distinguish the two is the institution looks at religion, looks at education. It looks at the field, right? The institution uh, where racism is either created, maintained, um, or an anti-racism work identified and eliminated, but the institution more reflects those institutional um, social structures 
in which we as individuals participate, we advance, we look to maintain, we look to protect. Um, that includes family, that includes our religion, that includes our workforce, our education, et cetera. So systemic racism and institutional racism are two very distinguishable terms and we, we need to approach them differently because I think sometimes what's happening or what's happening in this work is that we're putting it all together, we're lumping it all together, which kind of as it, it, it serves as a warning for us too that the, the things aren't being considered separately because they are separate contributions to systemic and institutional racism. And so again, I, I mentioned that I had a little PowerPoint slide here to distinguish the two. If you've done any sort of leadership or organizational management training, then you've heard the discussion of inputs, outputs, and outcomes. And this is how I separate the three terms. Anti-racism is the input. So it's the work behind identifying, addressing, eliminating systemic and institutional racism, right? It's looking at the policies. It's the work that, I'm sorry, it's the work that examines the policies. It's the work that examines the practice. It's the work that examines the work norms or social norms or traditions um, that, that lead to sort of racism or contribute to racism. So that's the input, the work behind anti-racism, because you do need individuals to put in time, resources, uh, scholarship, research, all of that. Those are all inputs that we as individuals, organizations, systems, institutions are putting into the process. So that's an input. The output is once those things, once those systemic barriers or institutional barriers are identified, then we work to provide more equitable resources and opportunities for individuals or populations that have been historically minoritized or marginalized. So racial equity is an, I wanna say immediate, but I don't wanna, I wanna use that term loosely. It's an immediate output of anti-racism work. And then finally, racial justice is the outcome. Racial justice is the society that we live in that is equitable and just for all individuals, all participants. But you don't get there without doing all the other things before that. And that includes anti-racism work. Um, and you're probably wondering like, oh, okay, well, oh, there's a lot of talk about anti-racism, which is what this presentation will predominantly reflect on. Again, because it's the process, you cannot get to racial justice or say I'm a racial just organization or we are pursuing racial justice. Well, actually, you can say you are pursuing racial justice, but you can't do that without initiatives like anti-racism. Are there other initiatives to get to racial justice, other ways of getting there? Um, absolutely, and we'll talk about those a little bit later, but I wanna focus on anti-racism because, well, how do I say this? It's one of the, um, most common referenced ways of, of, of engaging institutions right now. We all know that, that um, How to Be an Anti-Racist is a really popular book or has been a popular book over the summer and it's in our language, it's in our vocabulary, it's in our discussions and so that's really why I wanted to bring a little bit more attention to anti-racism. So the term anti-racism tends to conjure some negativity around it. There's a lot of pushback. Um, and again, I've been doing this work since 2017. And I see the same kind of pushback back today as I did back then. And really, it's, it's hard to define what being anti-racist is, right? So anti-racism is the process. Anti-racist is the state. So the state of an institution, the state of an individual. How, what defines being an anti-racist individual? And so I pulled this quote um, from Ibram Endy's book, How to Be, Kendi's book, I'm sorry, How to Be an Anti-Racist. One either endorses the idea of racial hierarchy as a racist. So that means you support, you endorse, you participate in the maintenance of the advancement of racist practices, or you negate that altogether and seek racial equality. Then you're an anti-racist. And I know that that can get a little confusing and it has been confusing for individuals. Um, one of the very early on campaigns that I participated in, and for the sake of time, I'm referencing my notes. Um, one of the institutions that I started out consulting with, and you'll hear about it a little bit later, their president, um, after an incident on campus that then went viral on their social media, it even included an email being addressed to all faculty, staff, and students that was directed at a couple of faculty members that was really, um, I'll just, I guess, be very blunt and honest about that. It was very bigoted, it was very homophobic, um, and it just sort of, the president really responded with, 
we're going to become an anti-racist institution. We're not going to uh, continue to contribute to these activities that promote this divisiveness on our campus or promote inequities. And so what does it mean to become an anti-racist institution, which is I think what a lot of organizations are trying to pursue at this moment. Um, organizations, companies, corporations, even as individuals, how can I be an anti-racist individual? So in 2017, um, I was contacted by Dr. Roger Worthington, who's the former editor for the Journal of Diversity in Higher Education. If you're familiar with his work, um, he actually has been, was at Texas Tech several times. Um, he led a campus climate study for us in 2009 um, and just several other initiatives we've partnered with over the years. Very active in the National Association of Diversity Officers, um, where I was active as well. But in 2017, while I was fussing through my dissertation, and most of you who were involved in that journey, I do see a couple of um, um, participants and chairs and committee members uh, for my dissertation, you recall it was not fun. And no one is, I don't think dissertation has ever been described as fun. I say ever, but maybe some people have. Uh, so in the middle of my dissertation process, I'm contacted by Dr. Worthington. Um, and this is now public. We had kept this client private for a while. Uh, but this is now all public on their website, so it is public information. Colorado College reached out to Dr. Worthington. Uh, this is where the incident happened, where the president then declared, we are going to be an anti-racist institution. So Dr. Worthington reached out to me and asked if I could help with this consulting project. And maybe like many of you, when you first heard the term anti-racism or anti-racist, you kind of went, what the heck is that? Like, what does that mean? So that's exactly where I was because I, I definitely didn't want to turn down this project. It seemed like a quite exciting project. It was in line with my dissertation because I was really being brought in to look at the marketing and communication aspect of this. So I thought, yes, definitely, I want to participate. Um, but I had to do my own research. I had to figure out what this was. What does it mean to be an anti-racist? What does it mean to be an anti-racist institution? And how does that deviate from some of the diversity, equity, and inclusion work we're already doing? So 2017 was that year for us to do, we engaged in assessments, we engaged in, in, in many different initiatives. I'll go ahead and forward because I think I've described that. So again, like many of you, I was in that process and space of trying to figure out what anti-racism was. Um, I'm going back a little bit, I apologize. There wasn't a lot of literature out there um, at that time in 2017. There was um, Ibram Kendi's book, but it wasn't coming out until August 2018. So there was kind of that teaser. He had done some initial work on this. There's some research, very limited though. So as I'm about to engage in this consulting project, I had to stop and question and ask and interrogate, what am I about to do? What are going to be my outputs or outcomes uh, for this institution? How am I going to contribute if I lack the knowledge and understanding of what it means to be an anti-racist or an anti-racist institution? And again, anti-racism is the process, anti-racist is the state. So again, for those of you who were involved in my dissertation or heard me complain quite a bit about, what do you mean we have to choose a theory? I don't know what theory to choose. I ended up choosing framing theory and I promise there's a point for this dissertation overview. I ended up choosing framing theory and I didn't, I didn't add the definition here, um, but I added a statement that sort of triggered my, my research and my reason to pursue uh, framing theory and the dissertation topic that I did. Um, so even if you look at STEM core, think about when you were developing the mission, the vision, think about even as you were developing these seminars, what were those things that you wanted to be in the message? What were those things that you wanted to be in the mission, in the objectives, right? So what you're essentially doing there is framing. You're putting something into a picture frame. Um, and, and the other way I could describe it is for those of you who participate in selfies, I'm not a big selfie fan, but, or even just taking a picture of something, right, with your phone, you, you want to adjust, you want to get the right things in the picture, you want to get the things that maybe are cluttering, um, or maybe the background that you want or don't want, there's a process to it. So there's a process in communication called framing. What's the message that you want to put out and convey? What are the ideas? What are the, the notions behind what it is you're trying to advance? And so once I started to investigate anti-racism, I saw that it very much aligned with what I was studying. And excuse me, they're allergy season. Um, it really did align with the work 
that I was looking at. And this is a book that I'm really surprised not to find on these resource lists that have come out during the summer. The White Racial Frame is the book um, and the theory and the framework that guided my dissertation. So it's centuries of racial framing and counter framing. And it talks about this white racial frame. Really what this book does, and again, why I'm surprised it's not on our resource list or some of the resource lists that have come out is because it talks about systemic and institutional racism. And this is work that is, has been done by Dr. Fegan out at Texas A&M. And he's been doing this work and this research since the 1990s. And so he really talks about how we tend to frame things, how we tend to break things apart and put things together to advance a certain message. I'll get a little bit further into this or deeper into this later on. But again, I'm just kind of putting the puzzle pieces for you together to talk about how we went about our first anti race or how I went about my first anti-racism project. And then we'll, we'll come back to this at the end of the presentation to talk about how they all come, how this really comes together in this discussion of anti-racism and systemic and institutional racism. So one of the things that I did during my dissertation and I continue to do is look at how we frame and reframe the notion of diversity. So I initially started out looking at diversity and inclusion. But if you do the research, so my chapter two, right? So if you do the research, you know that equity work really came about. And of course, there were some earlier initiatives, but in terms of federal, in terms of how we've um, how we have recorded it in our history and in our scholarships, equity work in institutions starts with affirmative action. So we know that there was pushback against affirmative action. There were um, lawsuits filed. There were discrimination suits, discrimina reverse discrimination uh, dialogue occurring. So in higher education, what you saw happen was that affirmative action initiatives were then sort of reframed and, and utilized. Those practices were utilized under the umbrella of multiculturalism. Now, multiculturalism is, is a separate field, um, but it's also one that very much aligns with diversity, equity, and inclusion. So during this multiculturalism phase, which is about the 1980s and 90s, also when I was about an undergrad, you saw a lot of multicultural centers come about. This is when you started to see the heritage months come about in higher education. Uh, this is when those sort of multicultural celebrations, there was quite an emphasis on that, uh, but there wasn't so much of an emphasis in the strategy structures, policies, uh, retention, those kinds of things. Well, I, I say that there was, but it wasn't as profound as when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. So then multiculturalism, multiculturalism is also criticized and uh, there were scholars and researchers and practitioners that said that's not a, a big enough or good enough term to describe what we're doing. So then it was reframed as diversity. So diversity really ended up being a lot about representation, representation in the field and academics, society, et cetera. Um, hi there. <laughs> So diversity, again, if you, real, if you were doing this work or involved in this work or at an institution or in general, you realize that diversity was also a challenge. That's when we started to see Grutter, Gratz, and some of these Supreme Court cases that challenged the notion of diversity in higher education. So what happens then? Diversity is then reframed into inclusion to be a concept that is applicable to all. We're all included in this diversity journey. We're all... And for the sake of time, so on and so forth. So when people ask what is anti-racism, I say that it's really all linked to the DEI work that we've all been doing, because I know that as I've talked to individuals or I've consulted individuals who said, well, I was already doing, or I don't know what to do. There's a lot of it is tied, all of this is tied to the notion of equity. Equity, equity for all individuals, equity with an emphasis to historically minoritized or marginalized individuals. And so there's sometimes that panic of, I don't know how to do this work. In some ways we've been doing it already, but again, this is where I come back to the criticism, uh, criticizing this work because anti-racism does criticize some of these earlier sort of reiterations of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I see, I see my mail being dropped off. <laughs> um, so as we think about this and as we go forward, I know that I've separated the definitions and the interpretations, but I want us to be mindful of that many of these concepts have been framed and reframed because they're a little bit more malleable, right, to the majority population, whatever majority population that we are speaking of, but we all know what we mean, right? So in systemic institutional racism, we know that the majority has created policies, practices, and structures that prohibit the success of um, minoritized or marginalized individuals.
But when we talk about anti-racism, when we talk about equity, we're talking about all of these things. Many of these things, are, the language is just different, but the concept is the same, is what I'm getting at. So I'll pause right there, um, just to see if there are any questions, comments, concerns, um, before we move on, uh, anything maybe I need to go over again. And if my chat moderators might help me with some of this, I would appreciate it. If there's not too much in the chat, then I'll continue again for the sake of time and continue to move us forward in the discussion. We just had, um, we don't have any questions at this moment, but we um, just had one of our librarians um, share uh, open access to the white racial frame. Um, so she just sent the link so that um, Thank you. people who are interested can, can access that, so. Great, that's wonderful. So I'll go ahead and continue on. I, I, there are more pauses and breaks for us to have a discussion uh, down the road. And if I'm going a little too fast, uh, forgive me, I think I am on my fourth cup of hot tea. I've never liked coffee, so I drink uh, tea to get me going in the morning and uh, maybe a little too much on some days, but that's quite all right. I think the pace and energy will help us reach those 50 minutes and allow time for dialogue. So back to Colorado College. So how was anti-racism different than, as I mentioned, they're, they're relatable, but they're different. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what we did at Colorado College. So a special committee was formed as is, um, you'll find at most institutions, special task forces are organized. So there was a special committee that was organized, an anti-racism committee. Um, a consulting team was secured and that was Dr. Roger Worthington, his team, which included myself. This one was a little different and it was different for me as well. Um, how do you explain to your chair that you're gonna be gone for a few weeks <laughs> to participate in this consulting project? And actually I was only there for a week. The main consultant was there and it was a 30 day live-in residency. So he lived in graduate housing on campus. He attended meetings, he attended classes, he attended you know, a lot of different things to really get a comprehensive assessment and a comprehensive feel for what it is we were doing or needed to do in our anti-racism ass assessment. Now I say we conducted standard DEI assessments. We did, so it, they were very relatable to campus climate. And if you know campus climate studies or have participated in a campus climate study, you know what we take a look at. Um, we look at uh, representation, we look at how people feel, we look at inequities in hiring, uh, retention, uh, those kinds of things. And so that's initially what we, that's sort of the core of what we were doing, but we were also extending that a little bit further. Um, well, I'll talk about this. I forgot about this one. So this is who we met. We talked to faculty, staff, students, typical campus climate, as I mentioned, right? That frame in the middle, the image in the middle, it was our guiding framework. This is Dr. Roger Worthington's uh, DEI, Standards of Professional Practice for Diversity Leaders framework. So I know that that's very blurry, but I know that we'll be sharing the presentation and I'll be sharing some additional resources with Jessica later uh, to distribute to you all. But it was comprehensive. We talked to alumni. Um, again, my part was marketing and communications, but I still participated in a large part of these assessments. So what we assessed. Now here's where I say things were a little bit different um, in terms of campus climate assessments or standard DEI assessments. The president brought us in to really take a look at why there was so much pushback to the anti-racism campaign. Why were people not jumping on board? Why were people, why, why was there so much resistance to becoming an anti-racist institution? And, and I, I, I wanted to point this out because we're, it's very relevant today in my consulting work and in the work that I have with colleagues and peers, both in higher education, both in corporate or in corporate, uh, we're finding a little bit of pushback to some of this work. Um, in fact, this morning there was that executive order that, that prohibits federal um, or any, I, I believe federal uh, agencies or contracts from engaging in unconscious bias or critical race theory or uh, systemic racism kind of trainings. And so, um, so there is quite a bit of resistance as there was in 2017. So for those of you who don't know Colorado College, Colorado College is a private liberal arts college of about a thousand students. Um, so this assessment, although I say it was easy because it was a small population, it was still quite challenging. And again, our work was to look at sentiments, right? The resistance. We were asked to examine what is it that, that could help the institution move the campaign, I called it a campaign because I'm in media and communication, that we could move that forward and be successful with it. And so some of my findings um, in terms of, 
this work and their work and what we found when talking to those various constituents and internal and external stakeholders was there was some support. Um, you can almost identify who would and who did automatically support this institution or this initiative. And it was predominantly faculty, staff, students, alumni um, of color. There was some ambivalence to it. Some people just were like, whatever, it's gonna go away because it was related to an incident. So they thought with time it'll pass. Um, there was quite a bit of resistance because when you talk about changing policies, when you talk about changing practices, when you talk about changing an institution, you're going to get some pushback. And we did encounter that even from some of the leadership team. Um, there was a bit of denial. And again, I go back to the term anti-racist, right? Some of the things that people automatically push back against was, but I'm not a racist, like, but I'm not a racist. And I think that that's the challenge of the term anti-racist or anti-racism, because it, in some ways people take that on as a label and think you're automatically labeling them, but that's not exactly true. And then there was compliance. Because it was a top-down initiative, because the president stated we will become an anti-racist institution. There were those individuals who said, I, it's my job, I've got to do it, or the president wants us to, so we better advance this. Um, so those were kind of the, the broad sort of spectrum in terms of the findings that we had. Again, we were also asked to assess why people were not being supportive of this anti-racist initiative. And again, I thought it's important to share because you're finding a lot of this resistance today. Um, to whether it's called anti-racism or whether it's called racial justice, you're finding quite a bit of pushback. So what's happened since? Um, we met with the president in 2019 and the president has now left. She is now president of another institution outside of higher education. Um, she pointed out to us that the most resistant group, and this is nothing towards my faculty, I love my faculty, um, but she talked about the hardest change was in the curriculum or anything that sort of had to deal with the curriculum um, because the most persistent group was faculty. And when I say curriculum, I'm also talking about hiring. I'm also talking about tenure, promotion, and even just an equitable climate for faculty of color at this institution. Um, because there was so much of this sort of spectrum of sentiments, the institution ended up losing some of this momentum in that process, the diversity officer resigned. Um, and in fact, when we started in 2017, he was a director, executive director of their inclusive excellence office. Um, one of our recommendations was to promote him to be the diversity officer for the institution. Um, but he unfortunately resigned um, in 2019. So there was a lot of stuff that happened. I, I use the term implode. Uh, the institution in many ways imploded. Um, they do have new president, they do have a new diversity officer. In fact, that position was broken up into three positions. So they have new leadership and momentum, but I, I sometimes use this as my, as my background because I want institutions to know pursuing anti-racism isn't a quick fix. It's not something that you'll have a resolution to in a month or even a year. This is work that requires engagement as does racial justice, right? Because racial justice is the outcome and the product. This is sustained commitment, sustained resources, and sustained contributions to this work. So in the end, uh, these two were sort of the prevailing sentiments. Uh, the resistance and really the ambivalence um, ended up generating a lot of lack of support and new leadership has come in to try to revive that. Again, I use that as an example because it does require a commitment. So again, if you recall, I was in the middle of my dissertation um, in chapter two when this came about. And this very much sort of describes this anti-racism pro uh, process. And in fact, Williams is one of the leading scholars on diversity leadership, uh, chief diversity officers, if you're not familiar with his work, um, Damon Williams, who also visited Texas Tech about 2007 when he was initially getting some of his research and scholarship off the ground. So this is a model from 2007 that he used. When we talk about incidents, and we usually this refers to a campus incident, but it's also very flexible um, to use right now when we talk about a societal incident, a community incident, a nation, an in incident like George Floyd that went nationwide, it went global, right? There's an incident that prompts a response is usually what happens. 
And in that response, there are the meetings, um, there are the demands, there are the protests. And remember, this is 2007. I think sometimes people think that these protests and demands sort of came about 2015, but it was just social media that heightened our attention to that, media and social media. There's declaration of support. As we've seen, we've seen companies like IBM. Um, we've seen several organizations. We've seen um, different Black Lives Matter uh, organizations. Um, have successfully and significantly gained contributions, financial contributions, partnerships, et cetera. There's this, this declaration of support, right? So even within an institution, um, I'm trying to remember. So 2007 was, was one that happened on the Texas Tech campus, if you were, if you were around then. That was what I called the Facebook protest. Um, and there've been others since then, yes, but that's the one I actually ended up writing about as well. So there's a ton of declaration of support around an incident, right? So as a nation, as a, as, as, a, as a country, as a nation, as a world, as a globe, we made commitments, individual and institutional, that we will be better. We will pursue racial equity and racial justice, right? So there are planning groups, there's different activities and initiatives. And then when it comes to that commitment, when it comes to advancing it, this is where the resistance is really coming into play. There's a delay in implementation and their superficial change, or if things are aligned appropriately and the strategic communication, strategic commitment and strategic leadership is there, then you've got an a commitment to the implementation plan. Then you've got a commitment to the anti-racism pursuit, and then you have a commitment to racial justice. I thought it was important to bring this up because this really does describe, um, in my 20 years of doing this work, some of the, um, what happens when we see an incident um, when something occurs, it's a quick reaction to address, but then it fizzles out and there are other priorities that seem to take over or there's just so much resistance or lack of support that it becomes superficial change at the institution. And I'm going to address this back, uh, I'll loop back to it a little bit later. And this is what I call the diversity loop, if you saw that in the agenda item earlier. So you're probably going, you know, it's already 1.30, Dobie keeps talking about herself. <laughs> That's not, I'm gonna showcase another example, but I really want to get to you again for the sake of time. I'm gonna breeze through these, um, but I wanna show that the same, this is where my work with STEM really took off. When I joined Dr. Munoz um, at UHD, there were several initiatives he wanted me to tackle, but then he really was interested in the HHMI uh, grant that they had secured. I don't remember the millions of dollars that they secured here, the exact amount, um, but this was an inclusive excellence grant. So the COPIs, which happened to be the Assistant VP for Research and the Dean for Science and Technology, uh, decided to pursue anti-racism as the route to inclusive excellence. Having read my material, Dr. Munoz said, I think you need to work with them and help them a little bit. And again, for the sake of time, I'm gonna kind of go through these pretty quickly. So this was the timeline. Started in 2018, 2019, there were some trainings, there were some meetings, there were some initial initiatives Again, also with the STEM focus, I know I breezed through that one really quickly. Um, there was one of the things that, that really stuck out in my mind, and I was a part of the initial planning, um, and I was very cautious on how they pursued anti-racism because you, you don't want to just sort of throw that in someone's lap, and then that's where you find the most resistance. If you don't come at it with an explanation, with um, the right communication and the right information for to securing support, then, then your whole anti-racism initiative could go in the wrong direction. So anyways, they had a white coat ceremony for first year students. If you don't know UHD, um, UHD is predominantly Hispanic. It's an HSI, it's 64%, or it was back then, Hispanic. Um, and then the other ethnic minorities with white student population being the, the lowest. Um, it's a pretty ethnically diverse institution. And I say that because even though it's an HSI and we categorize uh, 60% Hispanic, there's a lot of diversity within that Hispanic population and Hispanic is the umbrella term I think you know that we sometimes use for Latin, for Mexican, for uh, American sort of designations. So one of the things, and again, for the sake of time, um, there was a lot of divisiveness around this. There was a lot of resistance. There was actually more buy-in than resistance, but there was still enough resistance for this to sort of go astray. So what ended up happening was the leaders to this grant 
couldn't quite find the resolutions or the momentum that they were wanting to in the College of Science of Technology, in the STEM field within the institution. There was a lot of pushback from faculty, a lot of pushback from staff. So one of the things that they ended up doing was that they held a crossroads training that was in the timeline that I breezed through. Crossroads training is a national organization that comes in and does training on anti-racism. So they couldn't meet that 40 minimum quota within the STEM field within the Science Tech College of Science and Technology. So in order to make that a go, they had to recruit others like myself and other faculty and staff members. So this retreat became a combination of STEM and a combination of institutional. So HHMI leadership during that time wasn't happy at the pace and the momentum to the institutional leadership. And it almost became, it did become very much a us versus them. So STEM leadership versus the DEI leadership. Um, they, they took on these initiatives and activities that weren't quite supported. And some of it was the pace, some of it was HHMI had the funding and the resources to engage in these activities, whereas the, the DEI team and office did not. But it ended up becoming quite a battle between those two, so much so that it was really difficult to get the anti-racism initiative up off the ground. Now, I will say that the HHMI group had a lot of buy-in, a lot of momentum. They formed committees and task forces, something that even resembled the president's council to which the DEI team was really upset about because the diversity officer reports directly to the president. Yet you've got another council forming that is made up of deans and faculty and directors that isn't in line with the diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives of the institution. So again, a model towards anti-racism uh, became quite of a challenge and the reason that the HHMI group decided to move forward with institutional initiatives rather than the College of Science and Technology is because they found so much resistance within their faculty and their staff that they, there wasn't momentum there in the STEM field within UHD that they pursued it at the institutional level where there was more momentum. Their thinking was that once the institution starts moving on anti-racism, the STEM field will fall in line. Again, my, I ended up rolling off um, in June as Dr. Munoz exited, but here were the recommendations I made at the end of the, at the, end of the grant. To let HHMI lead the anti-racism initiative, restructure the current diversity officer position. In, one of the things we always find in this field is there's a lack of resources, right? So infusing more resources, and this is pre-COVID, please keep in mind infusing more resources into departments that are being charged with advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then at the time, again, the assistant vice president who was a co-PI to elevate his position in the provost area to deal with diversity, equity, and inclusion so it aligns a little bit better. Now I did have separate recommendations for the HHMI group. I said return to STEM. You need to return to STEM. That's what this grant is about. That's what this initiative is about, but you've avoided the STEM field or the STEM area because there was so much resistance there. So these are just some terms I'm really going to go over um, and you'll, you can, I can come, come back and talk about them. I also warned against performative anti-racism. So that's the commitments without action. I talked about the white savior advocacy or identity because you had individuals who were saying, we as your white colleagues will help you people of color move this forward. There was a lot of dialogue that revolved around that, um, that almost minor continued to minoritize the individuals that were part of that, that committee. I found that really disturbing um, and I wanted to make sure that they were aware that they were doing that and the way that it, they were doing that almost came off a little oppressive. Um, and so that was one of my recommendations was to be mindful of that, definitely to research right about the process. But I also talked about if you're familiar with feminist theory, there's third, fourth wave and there's debate on whether there's a fifth wave. There's third, fourth, and fifth wave anti-racism. Third and fourth wave are really where we're located at. And if you're familiar with feminist theory, then you're familiar with what those waves represent. And again, for the sake of time, um, I, can, I do have a whole glossary of term that, that does involve, include this, and I'll be happy to share that. But one of the things that I really warned against was, and again, this was pre-COVID, or this, this was a little bit post-COVID, but this was pre-George Floyd, was there's a black white binary paradigm that talks about literally how things are presented or taught or written in black and white. Uh, there's research or there's a theory that says we can only comprehend or take on two things in this multitasking world. 
So in our study of diversity and history of diversity, we often look at African Americans in relation to white. We tend to exclude all other ethnic minorities in this black white binary. So what started to happen when HHMI group went to the institutional level, they started talking to student government association and student government came forward to say um, they were most that the black students at UHD were being neglected that the HSI sort of designation left them behind and that they weren't feeling welcome or appropriate resources, services. So in that conversation, the HHMI group shifted. And with UHD being 60% Hispanic, that attention also shifted. And so it became this attention to another population. It's almost like they jumped their original mission and started to focus in on this other population. So that was also one of my sort of warnings and recommendations was to not fall into the black white binary and that in their in efforts to be inclusive that they were often being more exclusive than inclusive and to be mindful of what true inclusion really looks like because sometimes we get caught up in those silos that we often talk about. Um, it's a theme that we talk about in our diversity first coalition in this work of diversity who does come first? Who do we serve first? It's this incredible equation that no one I, th I think has, has been able to find a resolution to. But anyways, those are my recommendations. For the sake of time, I'm gonna go forward a little bit more um, and, and address what I call the diversity loop, uh, because I think that that's really important. When we talk about anti-racism um, within the STEM field, when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, whether it's in anti-racism form, we often revert to representation. Who is where, who is involved in what, who's being recruited, who's being retained, who's being engaged, right? We often fall back to this notion of representation and that's, that's also true in the STEM field. So one of the things that, um, and I recently did an information technology anti-racism training we, we think that the science is free and the technology is free of bias and stereotypes and prejudices when we know that that's not true. Um, we know that it's in the curriculum. We know that it's in policies. We know that it's, you know, again, also representation, who's in the field and who's not. Um, but we know that these biases come to play, come into play into all aspects of STEM. And for technology, especially those outputs and products of technology. So I'm pausing to look at my notes to make sure that I'm on track here. But the same STEM concerns are the concerns that we find in DEI work. So how do we move forward? How do we go forward? How do we make sure that we are in line or that we are heading towards a racial justice path? Again, I know that STEM recently participated. I don't know if you all or you as an institution participated in shut down STEM. But one of the comments made after this particular strike was beyond the commitments, what are we going to do or what is happening within the STEM field? I will wait till we get to the end to pause for questions, comments, or concerns again for the sake of time. So I keep talking about pre-pandemic and post-George Floyd. Uh, there was a study done um, during the pandemic that looked at how institutions were planning on cutting DEI resources and positions by about 30% um, in higher ed, but also in corporations and businesses. But we saw the uptick of that um, post George Floyd. Now the George Floyd, the death of George Floyd really is what catapulted a lot of these conversations and calls for equity, uh, calls for anti-racism and calls for racial justice forward. Um, we are a part of a national movement that we've not quite seen before. I know in higher education when Mizzou occurred, there was somewhat of a higher education movement uh, to, to advance and to lead and to engage in some of this work, but really this is now a national conversation. This is a national movement. There's national support and then there's also that sort of national resistance that we're talking about. One of the things that, so I mentioned the diversity loop. As organizations and institutions have looked to become racially racial equitable, racial just, or anti-racist institutions, one of the first things we tackle is representation. So if we have more, that is going to do away with um, certain inequities. And while that holds true, we also know our policies, our structures, our norms, our traditions, um, even when you think about 
uh, STEM or when you think about faculty, and I'm, I'm kind of pointing out faculty here because that's an easy one to point out to, is what just because we've increased representation, do the individuals that are now in your areas, do they feel welcome? Are they engaged? Um, what does their retention look like? What does their engagement look like? So I do recall at UHD, uh, there was a department chair that talked about how there was lack of resources and funding for faculty of color. And he mentioned that he's not able to retain them in his area. And it became a further longer discussion and he talked about how his high turnover rate in his area. And then he really pushed back on leadership and said, well, our, our leadership doesn't support diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and I felt confident enough to be the voice of, of, of leadership. And I said, I think we need to look at what's going on in your department to really think about why faculty are leaving at such high rates, higher rates than any other department at this institution. And again, while we increase representation, that doesn't always tackle strategy, structures, norms, traditions that, we that these individuals find themselves in. And that's part of the anti-racism process. I see Jessica minding the clock and I've just got a few more. We've also looked at diversity training. So we know these books and the book sales skyrocketed. Now, in anti-racism, we have a sort of, um, I'll just for the sake of time be very blunt here, problem with these type of trainings because what these trainings do is actually maintain systemic and institutional racism. And you're probably thinking why or why and how because I've participated in those things um, either as an individual or as part of a larger group uh, over the last several months. The reason why I say they contribute to systemic and institutional racism is because they lay the responsibility and the burden on the individual and the institution gets to walk away. So they place the blame on the individual or the burden on the individual to say, I have these biases, I have these privileges, what am I going to do and what can I do? When in anti-racism work, it's looking at the institution. While they're important, it's the institutional biases, those built in, those maintained, those centuries long biases and, and systems of oppression are the ones that need to be examined. But unfortunately, these diversity trainings lead us to believe that it's inherent in us when oftentimes we lack the, the resources, we lack the power, we lack the authority to really make any significant change in the institution. So rather than it being just an individual examination, it really needs to be an institutional. And I you put a yellow stop sign there because sometimes institutions are happy with the individual explorations and the interpersonal explorations that unconscious bias and, and white privilege trainings bring about, but they put a stop sign, almost a yield stop on examining anything that the institutional institution is doing to contribute to systemic and institutional racism. Um, so I talked about the white racial frame and Joe Fegan. I know that someone has put that uh, as a resource link up available for you all. This is the diversity loop and I'll wrap up here. Um, this is again where I interrogate my own work and my previous work, even the work at Texas Tech, is that unconscious bias trainings, for example, were a compliance training that were created in the 1960s. So to avoid lawsuits. They weren't really created and designed to uh, advance any institutional change. They were more of a public relations compliance um, activity that were brought about to say, oh, but you're not doing, and the institution could come back and say, oh, but we are, we've engaged in unconscious bias trainings. And I think you saw some of that over the summers. Well, the thing with some of these trainings is that they operate within this white racial frame. We as diversity leaders are only given so many resources, so much power and authority, and so much opportunity to really advance change. So even our diversity, equity, and inclusion work lies within this white racial frame. So we cannot really tackle systemic and institutional racism because we're bound by this frame, we're bound by limits, limitations, and we're bound by leadership who often think the institution is fine as is, or place it burden back on the individual to resolve the systemic and institutional racism um, within the institution. And for the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and stop there. Um, I know we're quite close to 2 p.m. I will be sharing this presentation with Jessica who will forward it.
Um, the rest is somewhat explanatory, but I'll go ahead and add notes when I forward that for you all to continue. I did say that this was going to be an opportunity for us to discuss and chat, and I feel like we've run out a little bit of that time, uh, but I will hang on however long we need to for anyone who wants to stay beyond that. You're also welcome, oh, I was at the end, um, to contact me if you would like more information or have questions that maybe we can't address here today. That being said, Jessica, I apologize for going a little bit over or in your mind, you're probably like, oh, that's a lot over. No, you're fine. Thank <laughs> uh, you. But I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. And um, for those of you watching, I'm going to take off my little sports jacket here because I got, I get really excited and worked up. And as you can see, those of you who worked with me for a long time, you know that this is a passion of mine, but I'll go ahead and mute and Jessica, turn it over to you for a second. Thank you so much, um, Joby. Um, can you, we just had one uh, quick question. Um, I'm hoping that you can uh, give a little uh, more information about, um, you mentioned uh, some resistance um, that you met uh, at both institutions um, with faculty and staff um, who were not interested in kind of this anti-racist um, push. Can you, um, say a little bit more about that and then um, also give us some uh, really practical counter arguments for that. So if you know my background and I've talked a little bit about it, it's strategic communication. One of the things that I come back to and tell clients or the groups that I'm working with is that if you don't create a communication plan that outlines exactly what this initiative is going to do, what it's meant for, who it's designed for, and being inclusive in that message of who it's designed for, then you're not going to see the outcomes that you're hoping to achieve. You're not going to get that buy-in. You're going to get more resistance. Now, is that saying that a, an effective strategic communication plan isn't going to lead to resistance? No, because we're also dealing with society. Um, coming back to the unconscious bias and the privilege and the stereotyping, we're all social, and even racism, I'll include that in there, we're all socialized to think a certain way by the institutions that we grew up in and that we socialize and live in, play in, work in, practice in. So there, those messages are sort of counterintuitive sometimes to whatever message you're trying to put out towards anti-racism. Now, promising practices or, or best guiding practices, for me, that's number one, is having a strategic communication plan. Number two is having more of a grassroots approach. So having the individuals sort of create and sustain a small yet manageable approach and then grow out. What I've seen not work well is when it, it's very top heavy and it comes down. Um, not to say that that strategy doesn't work, but even the top down needs the most basic support from the get go. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for, for expanding on that. Um, uh, I know it is almost two o'clock, so um, in the interest of time, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up, but I think Dr. Martinez will be around if anyone has any additional questions. Um, for those of you who are new to SimCore, we'd love to have you um, join our membership. Um, feel free to visit our website at stem.ttu.edu, and uh, we'd love to have you engage that way. Um, we'll also post um, the video and slides and um, Joby, there was a request for your glossary of terms. So we'd yes, like to put that I'll as well. That. Um, and so uh, we can um, post some of those resources that you mentioned as well um, and, and make sure that everyone here in the tech community has access to those. So um, okay. we really appreciate it. Um, and uh, thank you so much for, for taking your time to, to be with us today. So thank sure. you so much. Thank you. And I apologize for not keeping an eye on time uh, very oh, you're effectively. Fine. But individual, um, you are all welcome to contact me with any questions, concerns, debates. Um, I'm happy to visit with anyone. I know most people have rolled off already, uh, but if you could extend that message. Um, again, thank you for having me this afternoon. And uh, I hope that it is my hope that when I do these, that the institution takes up these challenges and these dialogues a little bit further, which I understand with seminar, you have quite a few activities uh, that you'll be engaging yes. in the rest of the semester. We're hoping, we're hoping to continue to open the dialogue and um, engage in, in some new 
um, ideas and thoughts and, and hopefully behavior patterns as well. So, um, well, I hope this was useful in that pursuit. So thank you yes. for uh, your time and attention this afternoon. Thank you. Anyone else that has any questions, um, you're welcome to, to stay on and ask some additional questions. If not, um, feel free to roll off and um, we will be in touch soon.